Good evening, I'm David Axelrod, the founding director of the Institute of Politics. And I can't think of a more important conversation that, than this one, um, being situated where we are on the south side of Chicago. Uh, I think we're all sensitive to uh, the, the tension between our fervent desire for uh, public safety and the need for civil rights. And uh, I can't think of a better panel uh, than the one we have uh, tonight. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I particularly want to thank Congresswoman Bass for being here because she, <laughs> she could be in Los Angeles where it's 56 degrees right now, which is cool. Yes, which is cold, but it's a lot warmer than here. So we appreciate you making the long trip and being with us today along with the rest of this great uh, panel. Uh, before uh, our uh, introduction of the panelists, um, I just want to make a few announcements. Tomorrow night I'll be moderating a conversation about the political landscape facing the country as we head into the year's midterm elections and uh, all the other sort of breaking news political stories uh, of this moment with Amy Walter of the Cook Political Report and Mark Murray uh, from NBC News, two really fine observers who happen to be former fellows here at the Institute of Politics. Dinner will be provided after the event. Then on March 7th, the IOP will be hosting a conversation with Patrick Gaspard, the former U.S. Ambassador to South Africa, who currently serves as President and CEO of the Center for American Progress. Uh, in a conversation with IOP Pritzker fellow Anna Gallen, Patrick Gaspard will be discussing global trends that could factor into America's uh, midterm elections, and I'm sure uh, a number of other uh, topics. Patrick uh, is a, a man of many experiences and a former colleague of mine uh, in the White House. Uh, I highly recommend that. Uh, conversation. Reminder, after tonight's moderated discussion, we'll be taking questions from the audience. Please line up behind a microphone that will be placed in the audience uh, later in the discussion. As usual, we will give priority uh, for the first three questions uh, to our students. Please also remember to make sure your phones are on silent. Uh, please also remember to make sure your, oh, no, I, I, I feel so strongly about your phones being on silent. <laughs> I'm just going to keep repeating the same line. Uh, uh, finally, uh, sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date on everything IOP related, including internships, and events, fellow seminars, voter registration, and more. Um, now I want to introduce uh, Anna Guzman, a, a second year in the college from Sacramento, California, up the road a little bit from the congresswoman, uh, who is a double majoring in public policy and law Le law, Letters, and Society. Anna is a IOP events ambassador and a member of the W Plus cohort. Uh, Anna. Good evening, and thank you so much for joining the Institute of Politics this evening. For tonight's speaker series event, 21st Century Safety, Balancing Security with Civil Rights, we are hosting a conversation with four amazing panelists. First, we have Congresswoman Karen Bass, a California Democrat. Representative Bass has served in Congress since 2011. From 2019 to 2021, she served as chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. Today, Representative Bass serves on the House Foreign Affairs Committee and is a member of the House Judiciary Committee, including its subcommittee on crime, terrorism, and homeland security. Prior to her election to Congress, she served in the California State Assembly, rising to become the speaker from 2008 to 2010. Next, we have Aisha Butler, a Chicago-based community strategist who is the co-founder and CEO of the Resident Association of Greater Englewood, or RAGE, which is a community activist organization that seeks to create solutions and mobilize residents to better their community. Prior to her work at RAGE, Ms. Butler was a founding member of the Greater Inglewood Community Development Corporation and served on the Inglewood Community Cultural Planning Council. We also have Joe Ferguson, a current IOP Pritzker Fellow. From 2009 to 2021, Mr. Ferguson served as the Inspector General for the City of Chicago. Prior to that, he spent 15 years in the United States Attorney's Office for the Northern District of Illinois, including working in the office's criminal division for 10 years. Appearing virtually, we have Charles Ramsey, who served as the commissioner of the Philadelphia Police Department from 2008 to 2016. 
a Chicago native, Mr. Ramsey joined the Chicago Police Department, eventually becoming deputy superintendent. In Washington, D.C., he served as the city's police chief before joining the Philadelphia Police Department. Mr. Ramsey has also served as an advisor over the years, including for the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Our moderator for tonight's event is Jamie Calvin, a journalist and founder of the Invisible Institute, a Chicago-based nonprofit journalism organization that received a Pulitzer Prize for national reporting in 2021. Mr. Calvin is also the author of Working with Available Light, A Family's World After Violence. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished guests this evening. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, so our topic tonight has a historical context, um, and we've all shared it and experienced it together in, in recent years. And you can uh, date it in different timescales. In Chicago, we might go back to the cascade of events that followed the revelations about the police murder of Laquan McDonald. Um, in the years since then, the seven years since then, there have been sort of repeated, almost spasmodic events in our, in our history, the most dramatic being the aftermath of the police murder of George Floyd. And in a sense, it, you know, as you look back over the history, we've had these dramatic expansions of civic imagination of what might be possible followed by contractions. Um, and there's this sense, um, Joe in a recent conversation used the, uh, the image of Groundhog Day. We've been here before. Okay. We've been here before. And you know, the sense right now that our discourse about public safety, about respecting people's constitutional and civil rights, um, it sort of churns but doesn't advance. The, the sense that you know, we keep covering the same ground. And we're at a moment now, um, David touched on it in his, in his introduction, where widespread anxieties in cities across the country, Chicago is not unique in this, Hyde Park, the community we're in right now is not unique in this. Rising anxieties about violent crime have, um, really sort of heightened the tension <coughs> the tension implied between security and and constitutional rights in the, the title of this talk this conference this uh, uh, panel and I guess I want to say at the outset that I know from talking to to the panelists that I think everybody you're going to hear from believes that that is a false binary that, um, that we can transcend the, 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 the sort of opposition, that it's not an either or proposition, but it's easier to say that than to give it real practical expression in the lives of people in the places where they live. And I wanna start with, um, with, with Asia Butler who s speaks from the ground immersed in uh, uh, one of those places, a community on the south side of Chicago, um, that I think it's fair to say is representative of many communities where the concern with safety is paramount for people, but it's safety both from violent crime and from abusive policing. And I, I would just be curious, sort of, how you see this moment. I think we have, we have people who are really looking for perspective and a way of thinking about where we are. Um, thank you, and I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me um, this evening. Um, I do feel like all of us have gotten to the point where we've seen these kind of, you know, discourses or these incidents and. And we also feel them on the streets in our community from questioning or you know, badgering sometimes from our police force. And I, I just think people are at the point where they're um, 
their ease or their mind is not, I would say they just in general, their minds are not as ease at ease. And so this bubble of tension from reliving, you know, how sometimes our, you know, black lives are not looked at as humanized, you know, people, <laughs> like we aren't looked at as humans and it's this play and then you get some of the folks the beat officers who treat you as such um, is difficult. And then for citizens like myself, for residents like Rage, who know we all want a safe, thriving community, and we know we all have a role in a safe, thriving community, ha are still grappling with, I mean, to this day right now, um, with how do we do that in sync with our law enforcement and knowing what their role is, and we respect that, and and vice versa, they respect what our roles are. Um, we feel like we're first responders as well, and we have intel on the ground as well. And and this type of discussion or discourse between our folks who are literally patrolling my area right now, and if somebody like myself, it's, it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And so we're just trying to figure out every way possible that it will start existing. Um, we can't stop the crime. I mean, I know I can't stop. I'm not sitting here trying to stop people with bullets. I'm not, that's not my job. I know my role. Um, but I think if it's folks who are trained to truly protect the citizens and, and truly make sure that folks are not in harm's way, um, you definitely can't be the perpetrators of that. So I'll, I'll stop there. You made a remark in an earlier conversation about f feeling like you were civilians caught between yeah. two. Can you yeah, kind of, kind of. Um, you know, it's very, it's been very militarized, and I mean, when we think about our mass and the uniformity now of people with certain things that is because of what's happening in society it is a very military kind of way. Um, and so it, the tension, or at least the feel that you sometimes get from your interactions with the criminals or with law enforcement is a very militarized way of operating. I mean, I, I literally saw a huge machine gun, you know, like I, I, I thought it was in the movies. Like I had never seen something as, I didn't know that that type of um, guns were on the street like that. And so now sometimes you do feel like you're that civilian, like if we're innocent. What do we need to do? We, do we wear orange? Um, and so we just try to think about ways that folks recognize we are civilians who want a safe and thriving community and whatever is happening between committing a crime or police <clears throat> brutality or whatever is going on, we just don't want to be in the middle of that war yeah. at all. So Congresswoman Bass, uh, I, we were talking before coming on stage and I learned that your career really began with a community organization in LA and now I don't think I'm disclosing anything I shouldn't disclose, <laughs> you're running for mayor. Mm -hmm. Wow. So what? <laughs> That's big. What's it like to enter into this moment in a major American city with respect to precisely the issues that were just described? Well, actually, what's compelling me to do it is is because I'm so fearful that we're getting ready to repeat the '90s, and uh, and I think one thing about our American culture that I believe is that we're kind of an ahistorical people. Mm -hmm. We just think in present tense, and we don't necessarily learn from the past. And so here we are again. I mean, this is similar to the 1990s. Uh, but in the 90s, it was crack cocaine. Yeah. And, uh, and that was a drug we had never seen before, never experienced, and the addiction was really severe, and it fueled a lot of the violence. Uh, I do believe that when this period is over, we're going to look back and connect it to COVID. Because one of the things, you know, I get emails throughout the day every time there's a shooting or a homicide from the police. And um, in the beginning, when we were loosening up a little bit, 
the violence was domestic. I mean, it was, um, it was conflict, it was personal conflicts. And what's happened around the country, and certainly in Los Angeles too, just a wave of people buying guns. Yeah. And then we have ghost guns on the scene, you know, as well. And so now it seems like the violence has migrated from internal disputes. Mm -hmm. Now it seems like there's an uptick in, in uh, gang crime. But the problem is, is that instead of learning from the past, we immediately move into doing the exact same thing we did before. We couldn't arrest ourselves out of it before. We're not going to arrest ourselves out of it again. But we also did not look at the consequences of mass incarceration. Well, we didn't even have that language in 1990. Mm -hmm. But the community organization I started in 1990, it was exactly because of that. But I actually had been involved many, many years before doing work, uh, police abuse work in the 70s mm -hmm. with our you know, infamous uh, LAPD. But uh, now, fast forward, you know, we actually address these issues. There's criminal justice reform that we talked about 30 years ago, but nobody wanted to hear anything. Yeah. So we've moved the needle very far. But what my concern is, and the reason why I decided not to run again for Congress and, and to go home, is, is because I see us forgetting all of that history, all of the consequences of mass incarceration, and going right back to it, mm. instead of doing what we should do, which is we have learned in 30 years how to prevent crime. We've learned how to intervene. And so instead of investing there, we're getting ready to go back to do the same thing. Obviously, if somebody commits a crime, you have to deal with it. The question is the resources. Do you put all the resources there? Or do you deal with the crime and then invest the resources in the prevention and intervention? Because we know how to do it now. So there's no excuse. Let's, let's bring Charles into the conversation. What's, what's the perspective when you hear these remarks of a police executive with your experience? How do we navigate the, the sort of intense cross currents that, um, you know, I would imagine somebody sitting in a, in a police chief's chair has to deal with on a virtually daily basis. Well, you know, first of all, let me just say that, you know, I, I agree with what I've heard uh, thus far in the, in the conversation. I mean, it takes all these things to really kind of create the community safety, which I term I mm -hmm. like to use as opposed to public safety. Because when I think of public safety, we t I tend to drift back to the traditional police, fire, emergency, medical, and all that. And it takes much more than that to really ensure safety of the community. We got to deal with mental health. We have to deal with substance abuse. Uh, you know, we have to deal with homelessness. There's all these different things that are going on simultaneously to make people feel safe and secure. We do need prevention. We do need intervention. But we also need to be able to take the people who are really violent and who are causing the harm we need to get them off the streets. There have to be consequences for that. So how do you have the balance? It's not a one size fits all. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the problem in policing that we've had in the past. If we get a call of kids loitering on a corner, you know, we pull the wagon up and just take everybody off the corner. Mm -hmm. You know, well, 90 something percent of the people on the corner weren't doing anything wrong. Yeah, right. yeah. I mean, I grew up on the south side of Chicago. I'm a native Chicago, and I grew up in Inglewood. Yeah, he's so I know all too well, uh, you know, many of the challenges that people face uh, growing up in an environment uh, uh, like that. So we have to find a solution. We, we have to go beyond the rhetoric and, and, and stop talking about it and actually do it. The problem we have now, what I fear, is because of this uptick in violent crime, there's a tendency, not just the police, but the public as well, mm -hmm. residents of the community, let's go back, just get them off the street, That's lock right. them up. I don't care what you do, That's but we right. got to stop this. And we wind up going right back to what got us into this conversation to begin with. Right. And so we've got to find a way to be able to have the dialogue, but have action at the same time, you know, measurable, concrete action that really deals with all these things and understand it's not gonna happen overnight. These things didn't develop overnight. They're not gonna be solved overnight. I had the uh, honor of serving as co-chair of President Obama's task force on 21st century policing back in 2015. And we addressed a lot of these, uh, these, these issues, but more needs to be done. And that needs to be updated. There needs to be reform, but it needs to be the entire criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. not, we need to stop doing things in a piecemeal fashion. And that's what we tend to do, and that's why we don't get any results. Yeah, I mean, it strikes me that 
It, it certainly has been a recurring pattern in um, our history that fundamental bedrock issues of racial equality are first presented as questions of police brutality, police abuse. So it's, it's not surprising that that's kind of where we've landed as a society. But I'd like to turn to Joe, to, you know, pushing off from, from Charles's remarks. Um, can we solve those larger questions through police reform? Or do we have to really have a different uh, mode of thinking altogether? Um, we can't solve them through police reform. Um, uh, quite frankly, um, one of the um, essential aspects of the problem, the longstanding problem, is this country has never had a conversation of what it wants police to do and what it wants the police to be. And um, because of our um, uh, sort of segregationist tendencies, um, certain communities are able to compartmentalize themselves um, from the presence of police, except when they want the police to be there for a narrow subset of things. And the segregated have police as a pervading presence in their community in ways that Asia is just speaking of, in ways that um, have a military affect to them. And that's actually a flow down from the federal government. The reason that the police have guns, like Asia is referring to, is a policy that dates back to the 1980s, where um, defense department um, overflow supplies um, simply flow down to localities. And when I, in localities, we need to understand also that there are 18,000 police forces or law enforcement agencies in the United States of America. And there is no single standard to govern them all. Right. And this was one of the, I, I, I read into um, the moving forces, the, the George Floyd um, aftermath, um, the Lord George Floyd incident and the aftermath was a prompt for um, the federal legislation um, uh, for which um, Congresswoman Bass was the lead sponsor that passed the House that got stuck um, uh, after it passed the House in March of 2021. But one of the things there was the, the notion of the development of national standards. Mm -hmm. And the national standards um, aren't something that in our federalist system can be imposed on states, but because the, the federal government is a source of so much of the money <coughs> that goes into policing flowing down to the local state and local levels, that those national standards can be set as a condition for the receipt of those resources, right? So we don't have national standards, and we've never had a conversation of what we want the police to do against a historical backdrop mm -hmm. where we've had them as enforcers of property rights of the worst kind and as of an evolving kind. And so, so we, we, we need to have that conversation, right? And then we actually have the capacity from there to right size what our police departments actually are. Um, in some respect, um, a, a lot of conversation needs to be had because we don't even have the language yeah. for this. The very um, sort of terminology used to set up this session, uh, you immediately interrogated it as a, and we've discussed this as a false binary. Um, the binary tends to render things transactional. Once they're rendered transactional, especially in these times, they're gonna be politicized. And once they're politicized, we have an inability to talk about them. It's not a binary. It's also not on a spectrum. And I sort of, and, and it's, not, it's not disagreeing with Charles. It's sort of a function of the language that Charles is employing um, and others, and I employ, which is they're not even on a spectrum where we're trading off one thing for another and safety and civil rights are two ends of that spectrum. Really what we need is a language that sort of brings us to the place where it's actually three-dimensional because those two things together bring something <coughs> entirely different that we have not actually engaged as a society. Um, and, the, and, and I'll give you a very tangible example of that sort of third way thinking. Um, Charles spoke of the challenges growing up in communities. That is not incorporated into the most fundamental aspects of how we structure our police departments. And I'll give you an example briefly of something here in Chicago is that it had long been thought that um, our non-representative um, uh, nature of the composition of the Chicago Police Department 
um, in which African American males are underrepresented was the product of African American males not wanting to become police officers. The data showed otherwise. The data showed that African American, young African American men apply in large numbers to be police officers. And it is the screening and application evaluation process that actually filters them out. And it filters them out in significant part on the basis of one, one single thing. There's a couple of things, but I'll give you one example. The background check. Mm -hmm. The old modality of background checks would say, if you had people in your family or people you were associated with that had contact with the criminal justice system, that had convictions, that were gang members, right? Those are red flags that meant you probably weren't going to allow, be allowed to be a police officer. That actually should be flipped on its head in these times. Those are the very people that we should be looking at as saying, they have had the lived experience to understand the communities in which we need them to serve, right? There are ways, but we need to sort of step back and say, what do we want the police to be? And what do, what do we want them to do? Because otherwise, we're in the place that we're in right now, which is the police are responding to all sorts of government issues. Government first response for which they are not trained, they are not prepared. And quite frankly, if we were to actually have the conversation, we would say, why are they doing that? <laughs> Why are they the ones why are they the ones writing traffic tickets? Why are they the ones, as noted by a number of the speakers, the ones responding to mental health when on the fire department side, if there is a call for a medical emergency, we don't send firemen. We send medically trained EMTs, but we don't do the same side of the And I side. I would add that when the firemen show up, you know why they're there. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Congresswoman? Yeah, I just wanted to say that I, I think we have two different types of policing. Uh, I think when it comes to affluent areas, police orientation is a guardian style to mm -hmm. protect and serve. And I think when it comes to the inner city, it's a warrior style. And I know in talking to many police officers and police leaders in LA, they talk about how sometimes recruits, when they're ready to leave the academy, say, I want to go to South Central because I want to kick some butt. Wow. If that's your view. They say view, the same thing about the 7th uh, District. <laughs> well, we're the training ground for <laughs> all rookies, so that's, yeah. that's it, the word. If the that's street. the way, and then you view the population as enemy combatants, <laughs> yep. Yep. then, you know, that, that that's a real difference. So, and I, I agree in terms of not having standards. We actually have 18,000 standards, right? right, in terms of the uh, police department. So you're right in terms of being able to condition uh, money. The, you know what the only problem that we discovered with the George Floyd bill is that even that doesn't exactly get you there because not every police department takes federal money. Because we looked at that, you know, to see if we could condition it. But, um, but I think that even though we were not successful on the federal level with George Floyd, the movement was successful. And I think oftentimes we don't even realize when we have succeeded because many states around the country, many counties, many cities did change a lot of laws. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't because of what we were doing in Congress. It's because of the hundreds of thousands of people that were on the street in every single state in the country, and then in many countries actually around the world. So I think it did have a significant impact. But I'm hoping that this time period also might make us as a, as a nation look at mental health. Because if you look at some of the most egregious, high-profile crimes like the woman in the subway, I mean, that was such a tragedy, yeah. you know, or the crimes that have happened in L.A., uh, those were people who were mentally ill. And because we do not have a decent mental health system in our country, I was sharing with you that after George Floyd's murder, I looked at 100 officer-involved uh, deaths, and that was over about, like, four or five months, by the way. And um, I would say 30 to 40 percent were mental health, because we really have, in Los Angeles, we say we have the most expensive mental health institution in the country. It's our county jail. So because we don't have that, maybe we've reached a tipping point where we have to say that we have to do something. My concern, of course, is, is that instead of looking at it that way, again, we'll just lock everybody up, mm -hmm. which if 85 percent of the people that are incarcerated come home, what, you know, what have we actually uh, accomplished? And then the other thing is, is that because we have divested from communities and shredded the safety net, when things fall through the cracks, we expect police officers to pick up all of, the, all of it. 
And, and, and a question is, when will we reach the tipping point in a society to say it's not fair to police officers that they have to yeah. put the pieces back together? That's not why somebody goes to the academy. But the question is, when will we prioritize investing in our people? So I'm, I'm intrigued by something that, um, that Joe said a moment ago about thinking in sort of three dimensions. Yeah. You know, is there a way of describing what we're aspiring to and what you're, you know, describing as a vision? Is there a way of finding, beginning to find language for that? Aisha, if you were, you know, the the, the no, well, the notion. <laughs> let, 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 maybe I can give a clue. <laughs> Wait, um, is there? Does it make sense? Is it helpful to talk in terms of? just a fundamental bedrock human right to safety. Mm. Safety as being at home in your place, in your physical home, in your body, able to flourish, that, that somehow transcends the binary. And I'm, I'm struck by, um, as many people will be aware, Dr. Paul Farmer of Partners oh, yeah. in Health um, died a couple of days ago, and one of the ideas that he introduced into international human rights discourse, mm -hmm. of which he was a fierce critic for the most part, is that, that first of all, we need to be talking about a human right to survive. Mm -hmm. The people have a human right to survive and not to die of treatable diseases for mm -hmm. which there are readily available drugs. Is there a parallel in your mind to talking about Public safety in our communities. When, when you when you said a human right to survive, I, I'm you know I'm very even though with a name like Rage, I really do watch language, mm -hmm. and I and I like I was like survive. Okay, so something means it's happening where we're trying to survive, whereas a human rights to me to live maybe mm. could be a more way yeah. that we approach yeah, it. For, for sure. You know, and and one of the things that I had noticed before this time and during the time with our work in Inglewood is not only, you know, did our, you know, police not humanize, you know, potential criminals, the average person didn't humanize our law, our officers. Mm -hmm. Like, it didn't, the fact that they have a, a family they go home to and, and, you know, this is, this is work. And so, it has become a, this, like I said, this militarized way of operations that just the human component to just live and live in peace just seems, I don't know, maybe people think it's just far off, but I think ultimately that's what everybody really wants. Right. And then we know that it might be issues that are happening mentally with folks. I mean, at the end of the day, we're all kind of imbalanced, you know, mm -hmm. and you can definitely say blacks have a little bit more trauma than most other, you know, folks here on, on mm -hmm. in America. So our, you know, sometimes that's layered on layer. And so it, it, for us, we know not to approach it from a police situation. It's somebody on my block that I see have an episode quarterly. And he all, the police always comes. And he really just wants to yell and kind of walk down the street. and. And um, it's really sad to see. And the first thing I say was, okay, we need medical attention here. Right. Um, you know, he, this is withdrawals. This isn't criminal behavior. And so really just a human right to live may be yeah. somewhat of a starting point. Yeah, mm -hmm. to be safe. You know? yeah. mm -hmm. Other thoughts, Charles? Yeah, well, I did just to jump in very quickly. Um, again, it gets to the whole point that uh, Joe is making around, should police be first responders for everything? And the answer is no. Mm -hmm. But who else is available Friday night at 2 in the morning? That's right. You know? And uh, how many emergency numbers do you have other than 911? Right. And if you do call uh, the other number, is somebody going to be there in the early morning hours to answer and then dispatch somebody? The answer to that is no. Cities have underinvested in social services for right. decades. Right. And now we ask the question, why are police the ones that have to, we're the only game in town, unfortunately. And that has to change. It's not gonna change overnight, but it does have to change. Uh, we, you talked about militarization. Police were 
created on a military model. We have sergeants, lieutenants, captains, chain of command. That might have been okay in the 19th century, in the early part of the 20th century, but does it fit today? Yeah. And if not that, then what? What is it? Again, it does go back to that question. What, what do we want police to do? And I don't think we have the answer to that. Because, I, I, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's complex. And I don't expect to get an answer uh, today. You know, do we need to get, uh, you know, more people interested in policing? Absolutely. Uh, some people get weeded out that should not be weeded out. Uh, you know, there's so many different moving parts and things that we have to take a look at and deal with. But we can't do it in a way where we make this too complicated. Mm -hmm. You know, when we start talking about, you know, looking at things in 3D and so forth, I'm going to tell you, you're going to lose money. You go to roll call and, and tell a cop <laughs> 3D and find out what happened, okay? Or go to a community meeting and say that. And so we've got to be, we've got to figure out how not only what we need to do, but how do we then communicate it so that people understand what it is we're trying to do and what's their role? What do we expect from them? And 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 I, I just think that's an important Chief, can I, part of it. Yes, yes. Chief Ramsey, uh, what do you think about the model like cahoots? And you know, we, we have legis I'm working like on, working on legislation with uh, one of the senators that would be similar to child welfare. You know, if a child yeah. is is uh, in danger of being abused or neglected, you don't send the police officer. Mm -hmm. You send the social worker. But the police officer might be on the curb if there's you right. know, a concern. Indeed. And so we have a uh, piece of legislation where we want to put hundreds of millions of dollars into health and human services for co-responders. And so yep. for a mental health situation, you would send the social worker, a psychiatric social worker, but the police officer might be nearby. The other thing is, is that if we took care of people, they wouldn't deteriorate to the point of violent crisis. So we have to, you know, do it on both sides. But CAHOOTS is a model like that. Well, the, You're right, and uh -huh. I'm ahead. sorry, I didn't mean to cut no, you. No, no, that's mean. fine. But, you know, that's where you, you team a police officer and let's say a mental health worker or a social worker, or something, and they go out together on these. And now some of those calls can be dangerous. Mental yes, health calls absolutely. And I mean, there's no question about that. Absolutely. Uh, but not every call is right. like that. So we, the screening has to be such that we know when it's appropriate to send the right team of people out there. And I would argue that even when you've got officers working like, like as part of cahoots, they should be in plain clothes, not in uniform. Mm -hmm. I mean, uniform can escalate a situation. Right. Plain clothes, not so much. We need to think about that, and who can help us with that? Mental health professionals to mm -hmm. tell us. Because sometimes you, you're unconsciously doing things to make a situation worse because you're not aware. Right. And so all these things figure in, but you're right. Cahoots, um, do we want to still be doing that 20 years from now? Maybe we have it figured out, well, we don't need policemen there at all. Right. But for now... Yeah, I, I agree with programs like that because I think it's important. Joe? Um, following on um, something that uh, Charles said, and no, Charles, I would never walk into a roll call and talk about three-dimensionality for sure. <laughs> but but I, I'm, I'm on the University of Chicago campus right now, um, so I have a little bit of latitude. Um, but you actually said something in the one session that we had together, and that is the men under your command, most of them, just want to be told what to do. Tell right. us what to do. And society has not told the leadership of police departments what it is that we want police officers to be doing. And that is pretty fundamental. And nope, we're not going to figure it out all out at once. But we haven't even started that conversation. And what we're doing is we're reacting to various phenomenon that we're, 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 we're seeing are, are broken within what ultimately is a really challenge paradigm that goes back to the beginning of our history without having had that conversation. That has mm -hmm. to be had at the policymaker, at the legislative level. There needs to be hearings con convened on that. Um, yeah, but yeah. politicians don't want to, I mean, I, I can talk about myself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because what happens is, is that people run on being tough on crime. Yeah. You don't yeah. run on a prevention program. And so, I, and, I, and I think what happens, which is so tragic because it's happening right now, yeah. you have these egregious crimes, and then politicians rush to say, well, I need to do a law. What we did is we had all these sentencing laws, but on top of it, we passed laws to continue punishing people after they get out. Yeah. But what, can't get a job, can't get a place to live, might not even be able to go home. 
it, in, in addition to being ahistorical, and I completely agree with that, um, there are a couple of other f aspects of American culture. One is we get to think non-consequentially. Yes, we don't. Right. We do not <laughs> exactly. actually um, uh, explore the broader dimensions of what we're trying to solve. Right. It's purely reactive in a political moment. <clears throat> That's right. And we don't actually examine what the likely collateral consequences are, mm -hmm. and we don't pr approach things holistically. So at the policy yes. level, we really have to sort of shift the thinking. I don't know who that is. I'll, I'll tell you that, 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 that the most successful holistic models that I see come from community organizations. That's right. Yeah, and I, I was going to jump in on a couple of points, um, if I could. Please. Yeah, so one um, jump in, I, one thing that Chuck um, talked about was like, who's showing up at 2 o'clock in the morning? So I sit with um, in spaces with tons of um, violence prevention workers, right? Mm -hmm. Like tons of organizations, violence prevention workers. And we get data all the time when shootings typically occur in a community. And they're actually between the hours of midnight and five in the morning. And so I asked a question to the violence prevention workers, what time is your shift? And they said they actually get off at eight o'clock. And I said, well, how is it that we have a time that data is showing that this is most likely when a violent crime will happen and the violence prevention workers are not working at that time. So it comes up to the point of how, how are funds being allocated for these type of um, initiatives. And then when um, kind of COVID first hit and we saw like, and we're seeing it now, like way more petty crimes, mm -hmm. um, smashing grabs, like things that we, like we have not seen happen on Michigan Avenue you know, in the recent years, I would say. And, and, I, and I was saying in the, in the communities where you know there are hot spots, why don't we just get a mobile car and like yeah. treat it like 911, like this mm -hmm. is a public health disaster. And I mentioned that to our mayor and I said it to our governor and you hear them now saying language what is happening in our communities is actually a public health disaster yes. and, and it, we need everyone, right? So law enforcement, so you know, so it's nobody really answering the call, they're already out ready for the right. calls. And so if you get, you know, just nicked by a bullet, now you're not bothering the hospital staff, you're getting a quick, you know, you know, fixing and then go about your way and hopefully other support. So you may start hearing that coming out around mm -hmm. people campaigning in Chicago because it Good. was mentioned to now said people running, but but just know you heard it here first. That <laughs> okay. really, it came from where community. It, came from. it came from community and just really putting all our resources and working and singly together to you know to really hit those hot spots because it is some spots that are heated. And I right. do think more law enforcement and more resources and more of a triage approach to those type of places could, could be beneficial. Well, I think if I could just very quickly, sense. one more aspect yep. of mental health, because I know we want to get to questions. Mm -hmm. Don't overlook the mental health of the police officers. Okay. Yes. Yep. Uh, you know, yes. I spent 47 years of That's active right. service. I've been to thousands of homicide and other crime scenes. Mm -hmm. What police do on a daily basis is not normal. That's right. It is not. And when you look at the high rate of suicide, the high rate of alcoholism, mm -hmm. of domestic violence that occurs within policing, a lot of that has to do with not having the kind of treatment, mm -hmm. mental health uh, uh, treatment that officers need to have. And that's something else that needs to be mandatory where there's a regular mental health checkup because the culture of policing, they're not going to tell you when they're having a problem. That's right. You'll find out after their behavior changes and indicates that they have a problem. And I think that's a huge part of um, uh, of some of the issues and problems we have in policing. Well, we can't protect anyone if we're not mentally well. That's right. And so it's very difficult right. to go out if you're not mentally well, All you know, to try to protect anyone, so. And it'll take a culture change in policing to be receptive to that. Well, and, and, and people's understanding of it. I mean, if, if a cop goes in and says, hey, I'm having a bad day, you know, I don't know, I'm, you know, I'm stressed out or whatever, they got a badge and a gun, you're going to put them on patrol? Right. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Right? So we've got to really think this through. It's not, it's not easy. There are some legitimate issues that we have to confront. I'm just saying we've got to figure that out as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. there, there's, there's one um, uh, larger issue that we tend to fail to discuss um, when we're talking not just about police reform, but the larger sort of enterprise of community safety and community well-being. 
Um, uh, and that is governance. Sound public administration. Every one of the things that we are talking about, um, I, I, agree, I agree with Congresswoman Bass, I, I, I agree with, with, with Aisha Butler, that actually, and, 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 and Charles, the, the language is changing. Mm -hmm. Where we are on the spectrum um, when we have these conversations is shifting. The place that is most dangerous about this moment is that the language and the conversation suggests that we are approaching that sort of higher aspirational point, but we're not delivering on it. And we're not delivering on it because we seldom actually look at whether or not um, uh, police agencies and organizations have the administrative competencies to actually implement the, the, the reforms that are being put in place. And some of that is short leadership, and some of that is vision, and some of that is, is will. But another part of it really is just old-fashioned, sound public administration. And if the organization, and this is one of Chicago's problems, um, is it is a challenged administrative organization. And so when you're talking about wholesale reforms, and I'm, 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 I'm a former inspector general, so I always think in these terms, um, uh, do we actually have the right systems in place to, to sustain that? We tend to look past that because we tend to respond reactively in a moment of crisis and not think about holistically within the a department itself whether or not we are building all of the scaffolding and infrastructure in order to carry through our aspirational policies. That's an important point. Uh, we mentioned it in a previous conversation. You know, there is no formalized leadership development in policing. Um, now, some departments do a much better job than others. But for the most part, there isn't. Good leaders are more by accident than by design, and it should not be that way. You know what worries me, uh, Chief, is training for officers and, and finding out that there's a whole cottage industry. In other words, who determines whether the training is even valid? Is it evidence-based? And to learn that there were some of the uh, folks from January 6th who actually have, I think it was the Oath Keepers, that, that actually go around and solicit contracts for training. And I've watched a few training videos that were just horrifying. Right. And, yeah, and so and, there has to be standardization there, too. Exactly. That's another area, obviously, training for national standards. I mean, it's we're all over the place. And it's not just extremist groups like Oath Keepers and so right. forth. There are other groups that actually uh, develop policy. A department can buy a policy. Uh, you know, uh, training curriculum and so forth. And it is not, believe me, most of it is not very good. It's not what we're talking about now. It's right. not going to take us to another place. Uh, and, and so, yeah, that's why it's so critically important that there be some standards set so that we can start to eliminate a lot of this stuff that's just causing a, a lot of confusion and a lot of issues. Well, I think we should open the conversation up and sure. include the audience. Um, this has been, from my perspective, the kind of conversation we were hoping to have um, to really demonstrate that it's possible from a, a multiplicity of perspectives to talk about the same thing, <laughs> even though you know we're grappling with with really resistant questions and issues. So I think. Uh, if nothing else, we've kind of modeled the possibility of the sort of discourse we aspire to. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm grateful to the panelists for that. But if anybody has questions, there are uh, microphones that have been set up. Um, Hi, my name is Graham Harwood. I'm a first year public policy student at the Harris School. Um, so particularly to you, Representative Bass, um, there's a very easy message for the side against this, and it takes an hour and whatever conversation to get into all the nuances of what's going on. Do you guys have any possibilities of better messaging around what we can do to explain this nuance and why it involves co cohorts and all these other things that it just, it's much easier to sell the other side, stop crime? Right. <laughs> if you have any ideas, I would, I would love to hear them. You know, well, I mean, I'm a Democrat. We're terrible at messaging sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 you know, I mean, I, I, I do, I, I guess for me, it's going around, because I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle of this right now, 
in, in trying to run for mayor. And um, just bringing up the past and talking about the failure of what happened in the 1990s when we started locking everybody up. But it's convincing people in other neighborhoods that didn't experience the consequences of it, you know? And people don't realize that after people go to jail that politicians punish people when they get out. I mean, it used to be a, a saying in our culture that if you did your time, you paid your debt to society, you were reintegrated back in. We don't allow that now. So my best way of talking about it in LA is to get people to understand that when you leave prison, what we're doing now is we're putting people on the street in tents. We have 40,000 unhoused people in Los Angeles City, tents cities everywhere. Mm. And many of those people, not all of them, the different categories, leave prison and go to tents. So I have to constantly paint a picture, but I'm not good at slogans are quick messages. Thank you. Hi, thank you. I'm Hina Mohammed. I'm a first year master's in public policy student at the Harris School um, and a background in police reform as well, though obviously not as extensive as the panel. Um, and one of the things I wanted to ask about is a lot of the concept that we've talked about, stuff like mental health triaging, um, you know, sort of moving police out of social policy challenges like homelessness or drugs or prostitution. And, and a lot of these challenges that we've put policing in inherently are like abolitionist concept. But the conversation around defund and abolition is terrifying for people, especially because it's polarizing. And I wanted to ask, we've sort of pitched a lot of these arguments today and in a really cohesive and constructive way. But as soon as we put the language and, and, and this follows on your point around comms, this is where we lose people. But then in the activist space, and there is a even bigger growing space around activism in criminal justice, and I think it's so incredibly important. And you know, a lot of the movement in 2020 came from that space. They deserve to be able to, for, to be heard in that language as well. And I think when we say things like, defund's not gonna work and abolition's not gonna work, and then we continue the conversation to say, but when we say defund, what we actually mean is move the money. How do we reconcile both of those points of messaging? Because they do exist in the same space, and I think we might be hurting ourselves in this conversation by trying to distance ourselves from that messaging? Joe? Um, uh, uh, full disclosure, Hina and I have had a lot of conversations over the last couple of months. <laughs> um, and um, she may have heard me say what I'm about to say. Um, one of the problems that we have is that we all talk from categories, lanes, and silos. Um, and. Um, uh, on that um, notion of that spectrum, because it's actually something of a spectrum uh, in, 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 in civil, political discourse, and otherwise in policy terms, reform, defund, and abolition. Those are three different forms of aspiration to the same thing. Um, these aren't either ors, even though our political inclinations um, uh, tend towards um, uh, treating them as either ors. It's both ands, and we were, we were blessed by having a Chicago police officer come to one of our sessions and be posed a similar question, um, for which um, his response before um, an agog group of students <coughs> was reform, defund, and abolition. Yes, yes, and yes, all at the same time. Reform are the things that we can do immediately, and those who are reformers who tend to be the folks that come from the well-heeled communities who have a moment of consciousness, are supporting, therefore, the bigger enterprise, they need to recognize mm -hmm. that, the, that the project is much bigger than what is immediately within our grasp. Abolition is our aspirations, and we shouldn't stop aspiring to a world in which police aren't needed. This is America, that's never gonna happen. It's certainly never gonna happen so long as we have a Second Amendment interpreted as the Supreme <laughs> Court did in the Heller case. Um, however, we should not cease aspiring to it. So that should be part of the conversation simultaneously as we're discussing reforms and as we are implementing reforms with good public administration. And defund, defund is not a goal, it's an outcome. And it's an outcome that constitutes a metric that we actually are transcending reform to a place where we are shrinking the footprint of police and policing. It's an outcome. 
It's a metric for our greater aspirations. All three things need to happen at once. We need to depoliticize these terms, and we need to talk from actually the shared space, which is we all want safety, and we all want our civil rights honored. All of these things need to be done at once. Thanks, Joe. I'm going to take the liberty to extend the question slightly to Charles, because I think this conversation is how do we move this into the space of talking to our police officers. Every officer I've spoken to knows they don't want to be a social worker with a gun. They shouldn't be in that space, and they're forced to be in that space. How do we take that language and bring in our police officers into that conversation in a way that's not defensive and isn't a direct attack on them and their work? I think part of the problem is they just don't believe it's going to happen. I mean, this isn't exactly a new conversation, okay? <laughs> and so, uh, again, you know, when if they actually see uh, change, let's use defund as an example. You may shrink the footprint of the police one place, but then you have to grow the fo footprint somewhere else mm -hmm. where it needs to be, whether it's mental health, whether it's, you know, uh, substance abuse or homelessness, or outreach, and, I mean, you know, because the reality is that you're not going to get where you need to go by taking a few million dollars out of a police budget for a year and think that somehow that's going to make a difference. In reality, you know, in the departments that I ran, about 96% of my budget was personnel costs. Mm. So there's not a whole lot there uh, to pull out. And so, you know, when police officers actually see the change occurring and someone else picking up the slack, then I think you can really have that conversation and people will listen. But right now, you say it, but then they go right out and the first call for service they're going to get is someone going through some mental health crisis mm -hmm. or deal with the homeless encampment over at so-and-so and so-and-so, and, -so -and, -so and, and that's what they're going to have to deal with during that tour of duty. So why should they believe it? Why should they listen? Thank you. Hi, thank you all for being with us. Uh, my name's Henry Cantor. I'm a first year in the college, and I'm one of Joe's fellows ambassadors um, this quarter, so I've had a lot of conversations with him, too. Uh, something that Joe and I talk a lot about is kind of the tension between security and serviceability with police officers, and kind of what Hino was speaking about, police officers who are deputized um, in areas that are more violent maybe don't want to have the role of taking on mental health. Um, and so how effective would you see kind of stratifying the roles of the police departments to different, to different departments? Um, that way there isn't just one group of people responding to everything. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, I, I, as I hear the question, Henry, it's can we actually um, create sort of strata and tiers within police organizations where people specialize in different things rather than a one-size-all um, uh, officer academy training that then just puts them out to do whichever, whatever they end up getting assigned to uh, coming out of the academy. Can we stratify right. police departments? Why would you put that in a police department? Because it sounds like that would be better served in city government. I mean, we're just putting more, I mean, it's on the police again. Well, you know, yeah. I mean, so, Go ahead, Congresswoman. Um, I think there's a couple of different models, in, and I think that might be what you're referring to. One model says you have the co-responders for mental health or for other things like that, and they were part of the police department. Another model says that it's a whole other department, like health and human services or whatever, and it's a collaboration. And what's important, I think, is that, you know, and again, I mean, uh, you can judge the different models, but one model says if you put them in the police department, there's still going to be more law enforcement, yeah. even if they yeah. are social yeah. workers. Right. And so that's why I used, for example, the child welfare model, yeah. because the social worker from child welfare is from um, child, children protective services, and then they collaborate with the police. I think I think you know city governments are siloed. You got right. police, yeah. you have fire, you got mental health, you got human service, you got all these different things. If you had a, de a department of public of of community safety, and you had different disciplines within that department, whose job it is is to respond and to intervene and prevent in all these different areas, and have actual communicate, actually talk to one another, which would be a major accomplishment in <laughs> government, right? And be on the same page when it comes to trying to having goals and knowing, you know, 
what you're doing and why you're doing it and what you're trying to achieve, then I think we could start to get someplace. And I think that's fairly close to what you were asking. But if you house it in police, then it's going right. to stay in police. It's going to continue to have that enforcement theme no matter what. And, and, and I just think that that may not be the direction we want to go in. Well, oh, Chief, maybe I can follow up with you because I'm actually <laughs> proposing that, to have an Office of Community Safety. And uh, I would love to I would know, love your, to. But, but it would be in the mayor's office. I, I, no, it that, that's my whole point. Separate it would have to be. It would enforcement. have to be in the mayor's office because yeah. it would have to have the power and authority of the mayor to make other folks do what they got to do. Right. And so, yeah, exactly. You're exactly right. A cabinet level position right there, the mayor, uh, direct report. I, yeah, I'd love to talk to you. Good. I'm no. calling you. <laughs> that's, that's, that's fine. And if, if, if I could briefly sort of follow up, that when, when we endeavor to sort of fashion um, uh, models, um, we have to think about um, uh, the particular institution in the particular community that it exists. What is the history of that department? What are the particular cultural challenges? What are the operational challenges? So um, um, I, I'm intrigued by the question. But I, I, I think it's, it's one of many ways of doing the same thing. So for example, Denver. Mm -hmm. Denver actually embarked on the road to co-responder and, and mental health response from within the department itself. And in that way, sort of disempowered the fear factor that what this was about was taking resources from the police. And as they implemented it internally, they realized, oh, we don't need it in the police department. Mm -hmm. We can put it into hmm. a community safety mm -hmm. component joined with other parts. So there's different ways. There's going to be different political and institutional political challenges. You want to examine that. Um, and, and it's important that it's just not a one-size-fits-all thing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Micah. Um, I'm a sociology masters and critical race and ethnic studies undergraduate student. Um, just got a new department, so hopefully that title will change. <laughs> <laughs> but I had a question. Um, I really appreciate the conversation about mental health and about unhoused people and about, um, I think, nonviolent drug offenses would probably like fit into that category. Um, but because the panel is also like, I think safety was in the title, I'm wondering about, um, kind of borderline violent offenses, like having guns that you're not properly licensed to have, and more importantly, like explicitly violent offenses um, that drive so much of mass incarceration and that are, are really easy to add long sentences to and really hard to decarcerate. Um, and I think I'll just leave it there. I'm wondering what role you think um, kind of talking about violence and decoupling the idea of policing from safety, or if that's necessary, like what role grappling with the reality of violence and needing to confront violence has in this conversation about police reform and kind of legislative responses to this carceral system we've built up? But I'll, yeah, um, it's all part of the same conversation. Um, when we talk about holistic whole government responses, um, what we're talking about is government actually attending to all of the ecosystem um, uh, inequalities and um, uh, uh, historical and otherwise and inequities that, that actually sort of um, reduces the forces that act on um, individuals to engage in some form or consider some form of criminal activity. Um, but that same mentality, both from the government as a whole coming from administrations at the top and leadership at the top, within the department itself, thinking holistically and incorporating, not, not bolting on um, uh, reforms and measures, but baking in sort of a philosophy. And then at the tail end, having the same holistic approach, somebody who has fallen on the, the wrong side of the line, even as they're in the criminal justice system, engage them from that holistic perspective that actually assesses what the challenges are that may factor into sentencing in the first place. And then as they're coming out of, of prison, not just leaving them um, disenfranchised and disempowered right. coming out of jail, but have the same sort of holistic wraparound perspective that we have at the front end. This is a philosophy. 
This is an ethos that has to pervade the entire, as, as, as Charles said, the entire criminal justice system. Yeah, and I, I, I would just add, um, I agree. And one model that they've tried, they're, they're doing in Inglewood and they also did on the West Side is just more of a restorative um, justice court where actual community members, so like if the, so you talked about like someone maybe who didn't commit a crime or maybe had, you know, a weapon or, you know, something that not necessarily, you know, didn't harm anyone, but definitely had a had an illegal, you know, something illegal. They do that has been working for at least for some of our younger our younger offenders who, you know, the community they're talking to their aunt, their grandmother, the neighbor is actually in the court talking to them about ways for them to rectify their behavior. I mean, it does kind of slice into some of the, the criminal, um, you know, getting locked up and, and being in jail. And so I, I've i seen that work. I don't know if it's enough data to see how that can be implemented more, but <coughs> I know some of our members have uh, participated in that and it has been helpful for folks who haven't had, you know, a violent background or a background at all. Let me just say that, uh, um I don't think that it's violence necessarily that has driven mass incarceration. I think it was more drug offenses. Yeah. I think what violence does, unfortunately, is leads, again, to my colleagues <laughs> coming up with quick fix laws. Mm -hmm. But I just want to mention two populations that I believe are totally left behind when it comes to criminal justice reform, and that's women and children. And uh, because the situation for women is just completely different. Women are ra rarely is it violence. And uh, women are some of the fastest growing uh, numbers in terms of the prison population. I just want to mention that. I'm trying to do legislation now, a comprehensive look at women from why they get arrested, mm. what happens to them when they're incarcerated, what happens to them when they're pregnant, and what happens to them when they come home. Because you talk about consequences. Yeah, you lock up a woman and the family collapses. Yeah, the yeah. kids go into foster care and it becomes uh, a big mess. So anyway, I just want to mention in, that. In, in, in quickly, if, in the same way that we ask the police to respond to everything, um, uh, the criminal justice, a criminal justice response is not a one-size-fits-all to everything that happens. And right. um, in that sense, we call upon the police to learn de-escalation. Our society needs to learn to de-escalate, and that needs to be reflected in this sort of more holistic approach to actually every aspect of criminal justice engagement. So I think we have time for one more question. Um, I, I'm sorry to those who've lined up. Well, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, my name is Eliza. I'm a first year student at the law school. Um, and Congresswoman, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, you know, having worked at all different levels of government and especially in community activism, it's been a little bit disheartening to be in law school and read sort of opinions that talk about when you pass a statute that has mandatory language for reform, and the court says, just kidding, we actually don't, there's no way to enforce mandatory, you know, reforms or, um, I guess, protections around, you know, Fourth Amendment and protecting from people's bodily autonomy and their right to live, sort of as Ms. Butler discussed. So I was wondering where you see the most effective way to put in sort of teeth to reform. You know, do you view it at the city level as far as reforming there, or do you view it in state? Because I'm from the South, and in the South, mm -hmm. the state mm -hmm. is not the place for that to happen. Right. So we view the federal, right. you know, the, the people in Congress can sort of save us. So I was, <laughs> sorry, I'm Don't just speaking for myself. Breath. But I was wondering, you know, I was wondering from your point of view, where the best sure. place to put in teeth. No, I appreciate that very much. Um, I really think it's all of the above. But I also think that, you know, especially when it comes to reforms, you have to do the mass education. You have to do the community organizing, which is going on right now, because I'm worried, again, that we're getting ready to take a step back. All of the years, I mean, literally three decades that went into moving the needle forward on criminal justice reform, and now it's getting ready to snap back. Mm -hmm. So you have to do the organizing on the ground. I'll tell you that when we did not succeed with George Floyd, we went to the White House, Senator Booker and I went to the administration and said, can you please do an executive order to move the needle as far as possible? But you know what? Laws don't matter if you don't do the organizing for people to fight for their implementation. So we're fighting for the implementation in California, but we also have to fight for the understanding 
and the tweaking of it. Because now what's being said is, is that those laws, those reform laws you pass, that's the reason why crime has increased. Right, right, right. Which is right. a complete lie. Because crime has increased in California and in Texas. Yeah. They didn't change any laws in Texas. So it's a constant fight. That's why the organizing, to me, has to be tied with the policy. Well, I think that's a, a good note for us to, to end on. Uh, thank you for your attention. And thanks to the panelists for a great Yeah, that's great. That's great.